can we handle the truth? It, we're only really a couple days into the new year, and already I have to wonder, can we handle the truth? This is This Week in Common Sense, starring Paul Jacob. Paul has been writing commentary at thisiscommonsense.com since 1999. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! All of our stories are about the truth, of course, but the biggest story of the year, and then maybe another story that's fighting, could edge it out, could be the biggest story. Both of those are really about truth. Uh, maybe coming from a little different vantage point, but I wanna talk first about two stories we did this week. Uh, we, we just had a nice little graphic for New Year's Day. We do that every year. We take the, year, the day off, the year off at that point, and uh, I've taken the entire year off. First time ever. The first story is really about pain and, uh, and about politicians. And it's about the opioid crisis, which um, is a very serious situation, a very serious crisis. And of course, there's also a crisis of pain. People who live in pain, who have severe pain day after day after day after day. You know, I've never been in pain day after day after day. It doesn't sound like much fun. In fact, if I'm in pain for more than a couple seconds at a time, I start to really complain. And, uh, and I know people uh, who have had different medical things or different things happen to them, accidents, where they are in serious pain. And the maze that has been created by our government in terms of regulating drugs and regulating doctors. And uh, we have a lot of people out there who cannot get uh, the pain medication they need. And so they live in pain and it's, it's outrageous. And it has pushed a lot of people into the black market to get oxycodone or to get uh, heroin or fentanyl or, you know, all, all kinds of things. And, uh, and, you know, I believe people should be free to make decisions about their lives. And look, if we are free to do that, some people are going to make bad decisions. Some people are going to become addicted to prescription drugs. And in a sense, uh, we're going to have the same sorts of problems that we would have today with people who are addicted to these drugs under the current system. The difference is there wouldn't be all the secrecy. There wouldn't be all the things on the black market. Problems that are in the sunlight are much easier to solve than problems that can be hidden that must be hidden. Uh, so uh, we would have a better response, I think, to the problems of drug addiction if we had a, uh, a freer system. Now, I did have a, a very good friend and a really bright guy who, uh, who sent me an email and said, you know, I've looked into this some, um, and I really think these companies – uh, had information that this drug was much more addictive than other drugs and hid that information and so on. And of course, it is, it is always true. Uh, one thing that's always true, unfortunately, is that I can be mistaken. Uh, uh, now, if you've read a couple of commentaries, you probably know it, it happens rarely. But, uh, but, but, you know, it could be that the facts of a certain case show that someone did know something, that they had a legal obligation uh, to, to make clear to customers. And of course, uh, if, if, if that's the situation, uh, then, it, then it is a law enforcement, a, a tort, uh, uh, could be both criminal or civil, uh, or both. Um, so, you know, that, that has to be dealt with. But it, it just seems to me that freedom is such a better way to go here. And we're learning it I think more and more people are realizing how ridiculous our policies have been about marijuana, which is a drug that has, you know, very, very low toxicity. You know, I don't think they can find anyone who died of marijuana ever. Uh, it's, you know, it's a safer drug than alcohol and other drugs that are legal. And, uh, and, and so we're realizing we made a big mistake, but the, the truth is um, we're making that same mistake on other drugs on cocaine and on heroin and on drugs that are really a, a serious, serious drug 
unlike marijuana, have have some pretty disastrous effects. And um, and and so, in that sense, we still are always going to be better off with people being able to live their lives in the open. And you know, if, if we see someone needs help, we give them help instead of trying to throw people in jail and and try to create. Uh, you know, look, we had alcohol prohibition, we've had drug prohibition. They've worked exactly the same way. They failed miserably in exactly the same way. It's just, none of this is surprising. Why do we keep doing it? And then the, the, the other issue that, uh, that um, I thought was kind of funny, uh, because it reminds me actually of, of uh, Mayor Bloomberg, New York City. Uh, I love New York City. I, I grew up from the age of two until eight. I lived in New Jersey. We used to go see the Yankees play. Of course, we were rooting for the Tigers when they came into town playing the Yankees. But I just have always loved New York uh, City. Uh, it, it just has a pace and an excitement to it. Uh, I, I adore the city. And... Um, and the people of the city and you know it is to me it's it's ground zero on earth but the the lunatics that they elect as, as their mayors the government of new york city just seems to be out to lunch and uh and you know we had mayor bloomberg who wanted to control you know big gulps and uh, as I've referred to him as a uh, gun and big gulp grabber, and, uh, and that certainly sums him up. And now we have Bill de Blasio. Uh, there was a story about uh, Domino's doing just a, a banner business on New Year's Eve. You've got all these people in, in you know, these little uh, boxes uh, with police. Um, I don't know what they call those things, but the little gates and the... And, you know, they're in pins, basically, like they're cattle waiting for the ball to drop on New Year's Eve in Times Square. So you've got all these people uh, who are captives. And boy, if they didn't remember to bring something to eat, which one man said he didn't, uh, and he was with a whole group of people who ended up buying pizzas. But if you got nothing to eat and you're in this thing until midnight, uh, I don't know why people do this to themselves, but... The, you know, it's a free country. And so this Midtown Manhattan Domino's has been sending people there to take orders and sell pizzas. And, um, and they sell them for twice. You know, you can get pepperoni, cheese, uh, onion. Uh, those are the three that were mentioned. And uh, uh, it's twice the price, 30 bucks, twice the price of getting a cheese if you came to the, to the Domino's uh, and got it or ordered it you know, somewhere else in the city, but, but, uh, but boy, people loved it. And here is Bill de Blasio saying, oh, they're ripping people off. They're exploiting people. We have the same thing when there are disasters and people, oh my goodness, look what they were charging for a gallon of gas or for water or something else. Look, when people are risking their lives to bring you a product, buy it or don't buy it. You always have that choice. It's called freedom. And here, it's so easy to see how silly it is because there's not the hypersensitivity of, oh, it's a disaster. But you do have to pay people to get them to risk their lives in a disaster. And here, someone's going to say, look, you got you to gotta pay a little bit more if I'm going to bring it to you. And, I, and when they know you're a captive audience, just like the one in the commentary in one of the stories, one of the, uh, one of the people who had tweeted in response to the mayor's ridiculous tweet, uh, had said, you know, what is this? this? It works like this for everything. It's called supply and demand. But of course, supply and demand, which is one of the, arguably the most basic economic concept there is, is completely lost on the people who run our governments, who run our societies. And uh, Mayor de Blasio has got no clue about supply and demand. Anybody who's wondering what the problem is with the high cost of higher education, they need to just think about supply and demand and the, the billions and billions that have been thrown at higher education. And then we wonder why, why a young person can't work their way through college anymore. Our problems have reasons and solutions.
So that was, I, I think it was fun to make fun of Bill de Blasio just because, you know, with all the, the holiday, I was tired and he's so easy to make fun of that it didn't, you know, it didn't fatigue me at all to do so. So there's that. On New Year's Eve, I did a commentary that, that uh, maybe meant a little bit more to me than, than your average commentary. They all mean so much. But it really, uh, for me this year, one of the, you know, the moments of, the, of my life was an opportunity to go see uh, Taiwan and go to this conference, the Global Forum on Modern Direct Democracy. Uh, Taiwan uh, has been in, you know, uh, you basically had Chiang Kai-shek come over after he lost against Mao and take over Taiwan and hold it under martial law for 40 years. And then you had, uh, since then, a real flowering of democracy and freedom and respect for human rights and that didn't exist before that. Uh, they have initiatives and referendums. Uh, they have courts that, you know, that adjudicate the rule of law. Uh, they have competitive elections uh, that, that appear to be fair and, and well run and uh, just a model of freedom and democracy in that area of the world. Uh, of course, our history with Taiwan, as we've discussed several times, uh, uh, is full of kind of betrayal. Uh, we've we've, we've uh, spouted off, I say we, some of our, our ambassadors, they're not really our ambassadors, uh, I guess Mr. Trump's ambassadors at this point, but have said, you know, uh, some of these countries in, in that region uh, some of these island nations that have been switching their allegiance from Taiwan, not their allegiance, I shouldn't say that, that was a misstatement. Uh, basically, they have been recognizing Taiwan and doing business t with Taiwan, mainland China, the China run by the Communist Party, uh, has been saying, no, 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 we'll do business with you and we'll do this and this, but you can't do business with Taiwan and you cannot recognize Taiwan as a country. They must not be recognized. And, uh, and so we've been kind of saying, hey, these countries should, should recognize Taiwan, even though we did the same thing. We don't recognize Taiwan. We, we in essence, have made uh, statements uh, that we will defend Taiwan, that we will sell them weapons, uh, that we hope that they can maintain their freedom from China, but we won't recognize them as a nation. And it's, you know, it, it's any, any person knows that just is silly. But that's how we, that's how grown men and women run our foreign policy. And, uh, and so they have an election coming up next week, which is uh, uh, President Chai, uh, who uh, uh, basically was a year ago at 15% approval rating. You know, they've had some economic uh, setbacks and so on. You know, China bearing down on them doesn't help. And, uh, and, and so, in essence, this year began with uh, President Xi in uh, uh, China coming out and saying uh, that he's going to, you know, that China uh, must reunite with Taiwan, even if it's by force. And just making it clear that they're willing to offer the one China or the, the you know, one country two systems deal to Taiwan, just like they have with Hong Kong. And, but if it's not that at some point, you know, by force of, of arms, we're going to take you over, which is a pretty serious thing to say. It's, it's, it's uh, the threat of war, uh, or you can have this wonderful deal. Well, uh, the president uh, of Taiwan very quickly hit back and said, no thanks, uh, a million times no thanks. And, uh, and, and in the meantime, uh, that got people to focus on sovereignty and on Taiwan as an independent nation, not being consumed and totalitarianized, which was the title of the commentary, not being totalitarianized by China. And then, of course, you've had since June, day after day after day, these protests in, in Hong Kong. And the whole idea of one country, two systems 
just laid out in all its ugliness. I think uh, George Will <laughs> referred to it as the, you know, the, the slow suffocation of freedom. And, uh, <clears throat> and that's exactly what it is. And we need to, rec- the whole world needs to recognize that. And China's not the only bad player. Uh, the U.S. has been a bad player before. That's true. Other nations are bad players. But China, uh, none of that should be said to hide the fact that China, as we pointed out, has a million Uyghurs in concentration camps, if the number isn't millions, meaning plural, and, uh, and is ready to squelch freedom anywhere they go. Uh, it is arguably not a communist economy anymore, but it is a totalitarian nation. And uh, it has a disrespect for the truth, a disrespect for free speech, a disrespect for individual human life and dignity. It is a country in which they tell you how many kids you can have. It's not one anymore, it's now two. And that's great. That's like 100% uh, uh, improvement, right? Uh, No, it's still the state controlling every aspect of of life. And uh, you see Taiwan, in in jeopardy and you see taiwan uh or you see hong kong in jeopardy and you see taiwan a hundred miles off the coast thank goodness a little bit safer but not but still completely in jeopardy i mean go look at a map and look at taiwan and look at china and you get a sense for how much they're in jeopardy and the truth is the whole world's in jeopardy if we don't stand against tyranny and, uh, and, and it, again, it's not a, well, let's whip up, you know, the U.S. should take over instead of China. No, no, no. We need, we need around the world, none of the big powers to take over, but we need to recognize China for the threat that it is and stop pretending that it's not. As people like Mr. Bloomberg, whom we talked about earlier, now running for president as a Democrat, uh, who told us that, uh, uh, Xi Jinping was not a dictator, uh, that the Communist Party has to listen to their constituents in the same way that, uh, that we have to, you know, that Bloomberg and other politicians have to listen to us. And of course, that's not very good. Maybe we're starting to realize what the problem is. Uh, but I think it's a lot worse in China. And so, you know, these things are, are, are coming to a head. And of course, this next week, the election in Taiwan, and I'm hoping that they re-elect the incumbent. I don't often favor re-electing the, com- the incumbent, but boy, do I in Taiwan uh, this next week. I think it's important and will send a message. George Will had argued in a column in the Washington Post, it's the biggest story of the year. I think he's absolutely right. But of course, there's an issue that you and I uh, have talked about many times, uh, Uh, I've written several commentaries about it because it's just bizarre the way our government has dealt with UFOs. And, you know, you expect a certain amount of of silliness, you know, of of, uh, fifth grade, you know, thinking from people when you talk about UFOs. Oh, you believe in aliens or, you know, they can't tell the difference between ghosts and aliens or whatever. But the, but the reality is our government has information about UFOs that they have not shared. I mean, we already know that for years, very credible, numerous sources in the Air Force and the Navy have said they're running into UFOs on a regular basis. Um, and we don't get the word on that. There's no, there's no, hey, public, we, we seem to be finding this problem. No, they're going to hide it from us. And there now is increasing evidence, at least uh, credible people, saying they have reason to believe that we have artifacts, that we have physical parts of alien craft or unidentified craft. Maybe it's somewhere around the earth, but we, we don't know where it is, where, you know, who's done it or how it, how these planes, like, you know, the Navy and the Air Force uh, reports, 
these are operating the way you kind of hear in science fiction novels back in, you know, 40, 50 years ago, the way that they would react, moving at high rates of speed, uh, moving in ways that we just don't have aircraft that can do that. And so, uh, you know, we, we don't get, the uh get a whole lot of information but we're getting more and it just seems to me that it's a it's a a situation in which uh the public you know the media doesn't seem to be as interested in it uh as one would expect but i think the public increasingly is going to be interested and i think they're also going to be disappointed in just how dishonest and untransparent opaque our government is Hey, uh, our podcast is now on SoundCloud and Stitcher. I mean, doesn't get any better than that.